So this anecdote has aged very badly very quickly. This could be the biggest issue that UK railway preservation has to gauge since that inaugural cutting of the ribbon at the Talathlin Railway in 1951. <laughs> you serious? Yeah. <laughs> uh, hindsight, it's a really clever thing, isn't it? I've no idea when this is going to end, but seeing as railways everywhere are closing down for the time being, I guess it's just a matter of staying safe, keeping well, and wherever possible, donating whatever money you can to your local heritage railway or preservation society. They certainly need it during these difficult times. As for myself, I may not be able to produce Steam Locos in profile for the time being, but I can certainly produce Gage the Issue for as long as I can, and here's hoping it's only a short while before we're allowed to go out and play trains again. For the meantime, stay safe, keep clean, look after each other, and don't ever stop being awesome. Especially to all the key workers who may be watching this. When the chips are down, it's you guys who are the real heroes, so thanks for being you. On with the show. In 1963, film director John Frankenheimer was brought into France to save a Hollywood feature film which had just lost its director about a week through filming, due to said director being fired off the back of the influence from one of its lead actors. The film was completed and released the following year as John Frankenheimer's The Train. Sounds like the most generic title you could give a film, but oh boy, it's a lot better than it sounds. So, what's the film about? Spoiler alert, you've been warned. In August 1944, the Allied invasion of German-occupied France is well underway, and the Nazis begin their retreat, in doing so, looting any bounty they can lay their hands on. One of them, Colonel von Voldheim, played by Paul Schofield, seizes priceless collections of paintings from the Jeux de Pomme Museum in Paris. These paintings are considered the glory of France, and as such, it falls upon SNCF area inspector and French resistance fighter Paul Labiche, played by Bert Lancaster, to prevent the trainload of art from reaching Germany. Along the way, there's sabotage, destruction, loss of life, fallout, strafing, confusion, lots of stereotypical Nazism, an interesting level of non-stereotypical Nazism for the time, and the best railway pile-up sequence in the history of cinema. It's one of those films that's gone down in railway circles as one of the best of all time. Even Trains Magazine gave this film the number one slot in their list of the 100 greatest train movies. So what exactly makes this so praiseworthy? The film was inspired, albeit rather loosely, by Rose Valland's autobiography following her documentation of the source and distribution of many priceless works of art during World War II. In the film, the entire French National Railway joins a big conspiracy to fool the Germans into thinking they're heading for Germany, when they are in fact turning around in a big loop and going back the way they came. It sounds like the work of Hollywood, but it's not far off a similar trick that was pulled in reality. There are stories of an art train being looped around Paris until the Allies arrive, stories of an art train held up by a wall of paperwork, and stories of a trainload of gold which then went missing and was apparently rediscovered in 2015. Perhaps the nearest real-life equivalent to this story is train number 40044, which was halted by the Free French Forces and its contents were liberated by Lieutenant Alexandre Rosenberg. Interestingly, the film's screenplay writers, Franklin Cohen and Frank Davis, were nominated for an Academy Award for Best Writing, story and screenplay written directly for the screen, in the 1966 Oscars, but lost out to Frederick Raphael, who wrote Darling. And because this is post-1989, the only thing that anyone can think of when they say that name is... Darling. Yes, sir? That. Still, this film doesn't have much by way of comedy going for it, which given the nature of the story is honestly a really good thing. There's a unique feel to the production values, despite the film being shot in black and white. It's very much reminiscent of overseas war movies, like Moss Film's Road of Glory from 1952, looking at the life of a woman engine driver in Russia. Frankenheimer's direction showcases a blend of short cuts, similar to those being incorporated in later films, and long shots which take up entire scenes, similar to those in elder films in general. Probably the only cinematography which dates the film, other than being in black and white, is the occasional zoom movement, which is often frowned upon by filmmakers these days over tracking shots, but for the time, it kind of suits the story. The railway action is superb. The locomotives featured are mostly SNCF S230B types, built as Chemin de Fer de Est Series 11s dating back to 1901, one of which can be seen at the French National Railway Museum in Mulhouse, 
although the most die-hard rail fans could probably point out where post-war locomotives appeared in this wartime setting. To those who can't, see if you can spot the American-built S100s or 141Rs that appeared on French metals after the Allied invasion. Oh well, anything to fill the scenery. The action can only be described as genuine. There's no green screening, no special effects trickery, all the smashes, explosion and demolitions are real. Even the air raid on the huge marshalling yard was done for real, famously as a favour for SNCF, who needed to modernise the yard but wanted to save money in the process. And then there's the iconic triple locomotive pile-up at the end of the second act. Modern Hollywood filmmakers could only dream of making something like this, because the train was made at a time when locomotives like these were expendable. Nowadays we'd use miniatures and CGI, or we'd simply show the aftermath of the accident while it happens off-screen. It can be hard to watch if you're squeamish at the sight of historic locomotives being smashed up, but it adds a sense of realism to the harsh and terrifying interpretations of war. But the train isn't just an excuse to wipe out the SNCF 230Bs. It actually has some interesting things going on with the character conflict. Schofield is understandably passionate for his bounty. Paris may be declared safe, but Schofield knows that out in the open country where everything is vulnerable, time is against him to prevent the paintings from falling into Allied hands. To the German army, his cargo may be degenerate trash, but he's smart enough to convince the German high command to authorise his train due to its value. Then it's just a matter of keeping it moving before the authorization is resented. It's interesting to see this kind of villain conflict at a time when the British and American propaganda of war films was slowly changing. If the train was made and released immediately after the war had ended, no doubt there would have been more emphasis on Yay! We won! The Nazis are losers! Blah blah blah! And there still was to an extent with the release of films like 633 Squadron that same year. But in the train, it's more complex. The bad guys are losing the war and subsequently want everything they can get their hands on during their retreat. Instead of just being stereotypically evil and incompetent, the key Nazi is a little more compassionate. That being said, Nazis will be Nazis, so... The contents of the train are so valuable that even the hardest characters can come round to it. Infamous engineman Papa Boulle, played by famous Swiss actor Michael Simon, is introduced in the first act as your stereotypical old boy who's been driving steam trains all his life and thus has no more f**ks to give. Pig, you should be careful how you talk to them. I'm too old to be careful. So when he's assigned the art train, he doesn't care. But when he's told just how much it means to his country, he ends up willing to put his life on the line to keep it protected at all costs, much to the disturbance of our main protagonist. Labiche has his own conflict, as his motivation for going through with this is more for his friends than his country or the art. He becomes more and more frustrated with the operation, as he loses more of what's important to him, waiting for the Allies to turn up and save the day. So much so that he nearly goes to the point of simply blowing the train up. That is, until he sees this. And therein lies the theme that balances this film out. For certain things we take the risk, but I won't waste lives on paintings. They wouldn't be wasted. When Lancaster insisted that John Frankenheimer came on board to make it more action-packed, there could have been a danger of it leaning too far on the action and not enough on the motivation for said action. The pivotal piece of the story may have been more ahead of its time than we tend to imagine. Railway construction in the pioneering days of rail travel forever united nations as much as it tore them apart. People lost their livelihoods due to railways. Others made a way of living over railways and continue to do so to this day. So it only seems fitting that a train should unite forces to stop it, redirect it, sabotage it, and ultimately die for it. There may be no award-winning performance in this film compared to other war films like Bridge on the River Kwai or Patton, but for all of the actors in this film, Lancaster threw himself into it the most learning how to drive and fire a steam locomotive, doing his own stunts, even changing up the story to account for his recklessness. While playing golf when he was taking some time out, Lancaster hurt his foot to the extent that he couldn't walk properly. So, after a brief alteration to the script, his character was simply shot in the leg so he didn't have to cover his limp. Speaking of taking time out, during shooting, Lancaster gathered around 2,000 signatures of Americans working in France, brought them to Washington, and handed them over to Martin Luther King in support of the Civil Rights March on August 28, 1963. 
So yeah, it appears Lancaster could play the tough guy on camera, but demonstrate compassion for life off it. I'm not going to talk about his generic will she, won't she love interest because it doesn't really serve that much to the story. It's just sort of there as a means of promoting the film to those who were worried that there's no women in it, but it doesn't slow the film down too much. In short, The Train may be one of the blandest titles to give to a film, but the film it's applied to is by far and away one of the best of its kind. It's a little slow in places, but the slow moments help to build up the quick moments. There's enough action to keep everybody invested, and just about enough character study to take your mind off the demolition. If you're not a fan of war films or don't like the sight of locomotives being destroyed, then it's understandable if you won't like it. But if you haven't checked it out already and you like anything centred around trains, then this is definitely one to watch. So yeah, that was one of the best railway films I've reviewed in my time. I guess it's only a matter of time before we have to look at one of the worst. I'm Chris, and I'm here to gauge the issue.